So Rebecca Weiss and Mark Fuller are here to share their latest project, which is the Birds of Aspen in the Roaring Fork Valley. Many of you probably know both of them quite well, and if not, here's a little bit about them. Mark has lived in this valley full-time since 1971 and has been a birder even longer. Formerly the Pitkin County Environmental Coordinator, he has a long history of involvement with local environmental issues and organizations, and today I learned that he had actually served on the Wilderness Workshop Board of Directors for 25 years in the 70s till the 90s. Um, <laughs> He has led birding classes for Colorado Mountain College and for ACES, the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, and he is a widely published photographer specializing in birds, wildlife, and landscapes. S tonight you get two speakers. So his friend and colleague, Rebecca Weiss, uh, was introduced to the appreciation of birds at an early age by her father, Merle Lin Lemberg, who has always enjoyed birding nest boxes and sharing her, his love for birds with others. Rebecca came to Aspen in 1993 as an intern for the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, like so many of us, um, and later coordinated the Naturalist Field School. She currently guides the ACES birding program, consults and writes for natural history interpretation projects, and enjoys birding and exploring nature with her husband and two children, all who live in Aspen. So we're just thrilled that they were able to make this happen, and we're thrilled that you're all here, and without further ado, thanks, Mark and Rebecca. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for that great introduction, and thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, I am personally looking forward to Liz's talk next season uh, to learn more about wildfire watersheds and catchments uh, following the late Christine fire. Um, that should be fascinating. And uh, Mark and I are honored to be here tonight to fill in and provide, uh, hopefully, Nice uh, slideshow for you with some entertaining facts. Um, we are presenting about our book, um, Birds of Aspen and the Roaring Fork Valley, which was released in July. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, who was our lead sponsor on this project. And they helped us right from the get-go bring this to fruition, along with a whole list of other generous donors and team members on the project. Um, so we're gonna start by just giving you a quick peek at the book, followed by the bulk of our presentation being a slideshow of Mark's brilliant bird photography that should be really fun to see, and uh, we'll regale you with a few facts about our um, a selection of birds. And um, let's see. We brought a whole bunch of books this evening, so we'll have those after the talk available for you to peruse and purchase if you like. Uh, the book sort of speaks for itself, so we'll just very quickly uh, touch in on that at the beginning and then merge right into the birds themselves. So the main reason that we did this book project was to help people connect with nature on a deeper level, and we feel that Birds are really a great vehicle for doing that because they are the most watchable form of wildlife around us. And you can enjoy birds and learn from them and, and connect with them, whether you're in the grocery store parking lot or out in pristine wilderness like this. It's a wonderful thing to do for all ages. And we designed the book to be useful to families and young people as well, uh, so that we can hopefully further instill uh, a love of birds, an appreciation of birds, and everything that flows from that in these great young kids. The concept for the book is an offshoot from Mark's years, decades of bird photography. He has spent hours and days and months in the field over the years, accumulating a vast um, array of stunning bird photos and from that, Mark got the idea of creating a book, and um, then I was honored to jump in at his invitation to do the writing part. The book addresses the entire watershed of the Roaring Fork River Valley, and the map inside the covers identifies 20 birding hotspots to give you ideas of places to go. And then inside, the birds are organized in chapters in a user-friendly way, putting similar birds together. 
and uh, making them easy to find. We profile 155 bird species in this book, and each one is um, filled in with its local habitats, what foods the bird eats, its uh, field marks, voice, and then interesting life history information, including migration info. So um, a segue from the book into our main talk tonight, uh, Mark and I decided to select 20 species from our book, and so we're sharing with you tonight the 20 best birds of the Roaring Fork Valley. <laughs> so <laughs> you might be wondering, how did we choose 20 best birds? You know, what constitutes a best bird? If you ask us on any other given day, we would probably have a completely different list because truth be told, they're all our favorites. So tonight we are sharing with you an assortment that shows um, our fondness for a variety of birds, those that are hard to find, those that are colorful and conspicuous, large, small, brown and streaky, everything in between, um, and across a variety of habitats. So for starters, the wild turkey is our first, um, our first bird. And this bird made the list of our favorites because turkeys possess their own special brand of beauty, um, especially as they flaunt it during their spring courtship rituals. The uh, males are known as toms. We've got two toms here side by side showing off. And the females are called hens. The males are decorated with all sorts of bizarre ornamentations, and <laughs> those serve to show um, and display that bird's individual level of fitness. So it shows um, their resistance to parasites, their ability to maximize fat deposition, and also their ability to achieve longevity. All of that is very attractive to the females, and um, one of their Prime, our primary ornamentations is this long dangler that hangs down over the upper mandible and it either hangs to the right or to the left, kind of flaps around. That is called a snood and it is distendable. So when displaying, the male can lengthen that snood and um, he knows that females really prefer longer snooded males. Um, so <laughs> that's what, <laughs> what they're doing there. Um, uh, <laughs> another ornamentation they have is called the skull cap, and that is the white, whitish uh, broad part across the forehead. And the broader, the better for that skull cap. Um, once again, this is all just displaying the bird's fitness. The bare head and neck have um, bumps called caruncles, and um, they can change color, so blood flow can increase to that area of the bird's skin and enhance the hue of the color so it can change from the pale, almost whitish that we saw on the previous slide to these brilliant blues and reds, all for attention getting. Then you see that long thing coming off the front of the bird's chest, that's called the beard. And males all have beards and once in a while a female will also have a beard. Of course, they have the huge tail that they fan out. They raise all their body feathers and really get puffed up, and the wings droop and spread. So they're just trying to look large and in charge. Here is a female, and this one happens to have a beard. Generally, the females are darker in color, and uh, their plumage is just absolutely gorgeous. Males and females have iridescent bronzed colors, uh, kind of shiny metallic. And looking at these photos um, is almost like looking at an art study of shape and pattern. So turkeys are awesome. And by the way, a flock of turkeys is called a rafter of turkeys. And you can look for these birds any time of the year, but they're especially conspicuous in spring when they are doing their uh, courtship demonstrations, and um, it's not hard to spot them in open meadows, especially near cover, uh, where they can hide if they need to. So that's the turkey. Um, our next favorite bird is the Barrow's golden eye, and this is one of our most handsome local waterfowl. 
Um, this duck made our top 20 list because it's so uncommon. It's only found in certain reaches of the main rivers here in the watershed in winter. Uh, the breeding um, range of this duck extends uh, through the northern Rockies of Canada into Alaska with a small uh, area in eastern Canada where they breed as well. And then in addition to that, they're in Iceland, and that's where they were first described for, sci for science. Um, and they're also found in just a few isolated, just right spots in the Southern Rockies and the Northern Cascades. So the closest breeding Barrow's Golden Eyes here would be found in the flat tops where there's over 100 ponds in subalpine, kind of rolling uh, terrain, very forested, providing the habitat that these birds need. And that's the, the southernmost breeding uh, population of Barrow's Golden Eyes. Um, males and females are uh, absolutely gorgeous with those beautiful golden iris they have, their eyes. Um, the males have a crescent-shaped white patch on the face. That's their main field mark that's going to cue you to the fact that you are looking at a barrow's golden eye. Aside from that, the males and females both have large blocky heads with a very steep forehead. So that's a characteristic shape of this species. A couple of females side by side. These are diving ducks. This one is just stretching. And um, they forage by diving down to the substrate where they feed on mollusks and uh, crustaceans and other aquatic invertebrates. They are very similar to the common golden eye. This is another duck that winters in our area Winter's in the same, virtually about the same places where you would find Barrow's golden eye, but these are found in much larger numbers. And you can see that they're very similar. Um, the forehead is less steep, it's just a little bit more gently sloped, and the males have a circular white patch rather than the crescent. So just for comparison. Um, any list of favorite birds has to have a sparrow in it. So we chose the spotted towhee for our sparrow to share with you tonight. This is one of the more colorful, larger sparrow species of the area. Males and females look alike, and they're named for those gorgeous white spots. These birds are ground dwellers, mainly. They live in the shrublands, uh, specifically Gamble Oak and Pinion Juniper woodlands. They also inhabit riparian areas close to the uh, PJ woodlands and oak scrub where they find um, the benefits of sort of a blend of those ecosystems together. They forage on the ground for all sorts of goodies. Here this one is looks like it's below a bird feeder uh, feeding on spillage on the ground. Um, otherwise foraging for natural wild foods these birds rummage around loudly in the leaf litter under the shrubs. And so imagine hiking along and hearing all sorts of energetic thrashing around and, and dry, loud leaves just getting churned. And it sounds like a large animal. Um, that's what these guys do. And uh, they can make you like start for a second and think there might be a bear digging or something close to you. And it's really just this little bird that weighs 1.4 ounces. Um, what they do to forage is a, a double scratch maneuver in which both feet are, are uh, scraped backwards to kind of um, churn the leaves and turn them. And they do this sort of double scratch hopping over and over again to reveal the goodies that they like to eat in the leaf litter. Things like millipedes, um, spiders, mites, grubs, uh, seeds, fruits, you name it. They're kind of omnivorous. Here's a male perched at the top of a juniper and um, in the spring, that's where they like to sing to make themselves known. And uh, the juveniles, nice streaky camouflage, so they blend in and um, have the ability to hide better, to protect themselves while they're learning the ropes of their lifestyle. So spotted towhee. Very similar to the green-tailed towhee. This is our other local towhee. Um, the two towhee species, species overlap in range in the mid-valley. The green-tailed towhee tends to range a little bit higher in elevation up valley, 
and the spotted toey range a little bit range ranges a little bit lower in elevation in the valley. Another shot of the green tail. Okay, Lewis's woodpecker. Um, Mark and I love this woodpecker because it's so different from all the other woodpeckers in the woodpecker family. Most of the other woodpeckers tend to be kind of black and white in coloration. These guys are so different with their raspberry pink belly and gray, um, gray around the neck and then uh, dark green, almost blackish on the wings and back. Just a fantastic bird. And their lifestyle is different from most other woodpeckers as well. They don't like to drill into very hard wood. They are kind of weak drillers. They will uh, excavate their own nesting cavity, but they'll also gladly accept an old woodpecker hole made by another species um, to nest in. Here, this one is at the suet. They do visit feeders adjacent to their prime uh, habitat. And when foraging in the wild, uh, they do a lot of um, hawking, which is flying out from a perch to catch a flying insect. And they do what's called surface gleaning, which is just picking bugs or insects off of the bark of trees. And this one looks like it's flying to its nest hole. Uh, they like to nest in cottonwood stands here in the valley. That's the main habitat they use. Uh, mature old cottonwood stands with plenty of dead snags and dying trees for that soft rotten wood that they like to uh, forage in. This one's showing its classic woodpecker tail with the uh, pointed retrices or tail feathers and using it as a third point of contact to brace against this tree so beautifully here. This is a juvenile Lewis's. So keep your eye out for these. Um, they are pretty much gone from the valley for the winter. Occasionally a few hang out here, but they'll be back again in the spring. So hummingbirds. Of course, we had to have a hummingbird in our top 20 list for you this evening. These are broad-tailed hummingbirds. They are the most common and abundant hummingbird species in the valley. And there are just so many superlatives about hummingbirds. They're the smallest um, uh, vertebrate. They have the highest metabolism. They can fly forwards, backwards, sideways, up and down. They can maintain their um, position hovering in the air even in a stiff wind. Uh, very talented birds, highly specialized for their lifestyle. Um, I love the shot of this male with pollen all over its bill and forehead. It just emphasizes how important they are as pollinators in the communities where they feed. Foraging on all sorts of flowers. The broadtail tends to forage on a, a variety of wildflowers, but it also goes to some sort of non traditional flowers that we don't typically think of as hummingbird flowers, things like willow catkins, for example. So they can exploit quite a lot of food resources here. This is a female. And this one is a, it's probably a sub-adult male, a young male who's just starting to grow that fabulous um, iridescent gorget or throat patch and just showing a tiny little, like a sole patch. The tongue is really uh, unique in this bird and only recently have we learned exactly how it works through high-speed photography and scientists who've spent years trying to create the right conditions to film and observe exactly how this tongue works. It's forked at the end, and along the sides there are these little flap things. So when it sticks the tongue into a flower, it um, absorbs the liquid nectar, kind of enclosing it with those flaps, withdraws the tongue, and then squeezes the nectar, which then goes down the throat and gets swallowed. It takes, um, it takes about uh, 15 milliseconds for a hummingbird to suck the nectar out of one flower. It has to happen really, really fast because they're going from flower to flower at high speed. The females handle all of the nesting with these birds and um, the nests are 
constructed of just whatever tidbits are close by at hand at the nest site that the female selects, but typically she finds a lot of lichen. Lichen helps camouflage the nest and those tiny little bits are held together with a lot of spiderweb silk. That allows the uh, little pieces to be held together as well as uh, allows a stretch factor for the nest as the young birds hatch out of the egg and grow. Okay, we had to put a small brown bird in the show for you tonight. <laughs> this is the house wren, and I think it's a pretty special little brown bird. Um, it, uh, it has modest looks, but I love the tiny um, intricate checkerboard pattern on the wings and tail. And then this bird also has an incredible voice, and Sarah, here we go, is going to help me play a few of its songs and calls. So this bird has a whole repertoire of songs and calls. This is the song we're hearing. Can you just go then, down and play them all? Can you do that one next and then go down from there? Number two? Um, no, excited chip calls. Go down from there. Go for it right now? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so here's some more. <laughs> what the wren says and um, this has been studied the different calls can um, communicate different degrees of alarm or different types of predators whether you have house cat on the ground or an aerial predator maybe a, a Cooper's Hawk above um, they also use these calls to maintain contact between a, a mated pair or between the adults and the fledglings um, and then the song is used for territory and um, mate, mate finding. Uh, so communicating a whole array of things, and there are a lot of subtleties to it. Not only do the wrens understand their language, but other birds understand what the wrens are saying too, and sometimes even mammals will know as well. Uh, so it's fascinating to um, consider the whole language of birds and how intraspecific communication works to help everybody understand, you know, there's a hazard present or, okay, business as usual, we can all relax and, and feed. Whoops. Okay, this wren is foraging and Mark captured it on this rotten log. It's listening for the insects inside the rotten wood. And then once it uh, locates one, it will probe in with that long curved bill and pull out the insect. So very, very curious and um, very uh, efficient foragers, insect eaters. They nest in cavities like this aspen tree. Here it is taking off. It's a great action photo. Okay, and the mountain bluebird. This is just such an iconic bird for Colorado. I kind of think it could have even been our state bird um, because we all refer to bluebird days, right? And um, this color of blue is just fantastic, matching the deep blue of our mountain skies. So very special bird, um, dear to our hearts, and probably yours too, I bet. Um, in winter, they flock up and they look like jewels as they glisten on the brown landscape. A few of them do hang out here for the winter. They do switch from insects to fruits for their diet in the winter. They are cavity nesters. They'll readily use nest boxes and woodpecker holes. Um, they forage on a lot of ground-dwelling insects like grasshoppers and beetles and crickets. And uh, here is a young fledgling virtually attacking its mother who has brought it a spider to eat. So hungry. 
Okay, the evening grosbeak, um, the rowdy yellow eyebrows and the chartreuse, huge bill on this bird were what caused us to put it in our top 20 list for you tonight. Um, absolutely fantastic bird. Really good looks. Here's the profile to the right and to the left. Look at that huge bill. This is probably the largest um, bulky bill like that of all the birds in the valley. And it's powered by extra large muscles that um, allow it to crush its uh, foods. This bird will eat choke cherry pits. It will eat hawthorn seeds, uh, box elder seeds, whole crab apples, all sorts of large, tough foods. Here it is on this berry bush enjoying a snack. This is a young bird reaching and straining and successfully <laughs> enjoying all that fruit. This is an adult female, so a little more subtly colored than the male. And wintertime can be one of the best times to see these birds when they come to feeders. They tend to travel in flocks in the winter because the fruits that they eat and the seeds that they find tend to be distributed in a patchy way across the landscape and working in flocks they can find their food more efficiently. Cedar Waxwing made our favorite list as well because of its awesome black mask and its jaunty crest and its absolutely silky brown and yellow colors. This is another bird that flocks in the winter and uh, eats primarily fruit, uh, even through the whole year. Um, they tend to be late nesters. Uh, they, they start nesting midsummer, kind of long after other birds have done their thing, because they need to time the feeding of their hatchlings with the peak abundance and ripening of local fruits. They are named for a red cedar that's uh, native to the eastern U.S. and the wax part is from the red tips on their secondary feathers. That's just a concentration of carotenoid pigments from their diet that's funneled to that part of the feather and that's a signal of fitness, um, it's thought, in these birds. And it just looks like they were dipped in red sealing wax, so that's where the name comes from. This is a juvenile. And my last bird, um, number 10, the white-tailed ptarmigan. Had to include this one. It's an all-time favorite. I think it's almost always on my favorite list because it's so iconic of our high country. These birds inhabit the alpine zone and their habitat constitutes about 3% of the area of Colorado. They are highly specialized, as you know, with their cryptic plumage to blend in to their surroundings. And their strategy is mainly just to sit still and rely on that camouflage, um, changing to pure white in the winter and growing um, extra feathers on their legs, feet, and toes that provide insulation and also work kind of like snowshoes to let them float on the snowpack as they walk around. They eat willows in the winter, so they'll burrow into the snowpack where there are buried um, thickets of willow and they forage on the buds of this highly nutritious food. They eat so much in the winter that uh, they can actually gain weight in the winter and then they produce copious amounts of scat, which you can find in the summer as you hike around in their habitat. They molt for about eight months out of the year uh, trying to keep up with the gradual changes in the landscape that they live on as the snow comes and goes. And the males have these wonderful red eye combs that are, are large and conspicuous during breeding season in the spring. And the females also have them, but they're much smaller. So, um, wonderful ptarmigan keeping the white belly and turning brown on the top in summer. This one is a, is a uh, subject of a research project. You can see it's got a couple of leg bands on it. 
And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. He'll share his favorite with you as well. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good evening. Um, trying to choose your favorite bird is kind of like trying to choose your favorite child. So I hope the, uh, the brown creepers and the, uh, uh, the other birds that I didn't choose will forgive me. Um, I'm going to run through these pretty quick because I, I know we're running a little short of time. This first one is the white-faced ibis. Uh, like some of the other birds you've heard about tonight, the white-faced ibis is not resident here. It's a migrant that comes through um, on a fairly regular basis. Sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. This particular pair was at Rock Bottom Ranch a couple of years ago. Uh, the first time I saw an ibis, it was flying by in the middle of a snowstorm, a late spring snowstorm, and uh, I thought I was hallucinating. It was so weird looking, but um, they actually do come through fairly regularly. They're uh, uh, a tall bird, but not a particularly big bird. They weigh about as much as a mallard duck. Uh, you can see one here right next to a coot, which gives you a good uh, size comparison. They're uh, very elegant. Uh, they uh, have a glossy uh, purple and, and iridescent plumage. And that long, elegant bill is really distinctive. Here's one in flight. This one's a juvenile. It uh, doesn't have that distinctive white face mask quite, quite yet. Uh, the San Luis Valley is a good place to see these birds. They're down there on a regular basis in the spring and summer. This is a Cooper's Hawk. Uh, the first time I saw a Cooper's Hawk, I was 19 years old in New Mexico. I was a camp counselor and being my first time in the West, I had on a ridiculous cowboy hat. And I came a little bit close to a Cooper's Hawk nest it dived, bombed me, knocked my hat off, sent me running. They're a uh, fiercely protective bird around the nest. They uh, prey mostly on other birds, but they also eat uh, small mammals. They're a accipiter, which means they're a forest hawk. Uh, they have relatively short wings and a long tail, so they can maneuver through the trees. Um, very, uh, very ag with great agility. This is a nest uh, up in the Aspen Grove Cemetery off McSkimming uh, at the uh, east end of town. That nest has been there for a number of years and the birds there are fairly acclimatized because there's a lot of human traffic in that area. So it's one place where you can see a Cooper's Hawk nest and maybe not get dive bombed. <laughs> here are a couple of the babies from a couple of years ago. Uh, they're fairly young here, probably about a week, maybe 10 days old. And here they are, here's one of them a month later. Uh, this is the Woodhouse's scrub jay. The uh, scrub jay is called in the uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab description, a reclusive bird. If you've got a bird feeder, you know these birds are not reclusive. Um, they uh, were split from the California scrub jay a number of years ago. And at first I thought that was, you know, ornithologists with too much time on their hands. But in fact, there are some significant differences between the two species. Uh, one of the really interesting ones is the bill of the Woodhouse's scrub jay is straighter and less hooked than the bill of the California scrub jay. And that's a special adaptation to allow it to more easily extract pinion nuts, which is one of their main food sources in this part of the country. Um, this is a young one in our garden from last year, and he was very determined to get to that bird feeder. Hey, 
and he finally made it. Um, this is uh, the nest that that bird came from. This is in a vine on our house. Um, and one of the fledglings fell out of the nest. So I put it back in and took the opportunity to get a couple of shots. That red, what did I do? That red uh, gape uh, gives uh, the mother bird a target when she's uh, stuffing food down their gullets. And a week or so later, that fledgling came out again and ended up on our porch and uh, survived to attack our bird feeder a few weeks later. Sandhill cranes. These are uh, cranes in the San Luis Valley. Uh, Sarah told you about the crane festival down there. It's really a spectacle. Uh, I highly recommend that you make a trip down there at some point in March. Uh, 15,000 sandhill cranes are quite a sight. Uh, these pictures were taken just a few days ago at Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge in New Mexico, where the birds spend the winter. Uh, they cut, uh, grow and cut corn for them there. This one in the middle is bugling. They have a wonderful honking uh, sound that they make. The uh, red on the head is a patch of bare skin. Sandhill cranes, hard, hard not to love them. Oh, and last summer, Rebecca and I had the exciting experience of finding a pair with young ones uh, up at uh, Spring Park Reservoir by Velgebel. Uh, this is the first record we've been able to find of sandhills breeding in this valley. So they may be establishing a population here, which would be really exciting. Uh, we're looking forward to going back in the spring and seeing if they're still there. Um, this is a American Dipper. You've all seen this out along the uh, local waterways. Uh, it's our only aquatic songbird really interesting bird with a very specialized lifestyle and a good indicator of water quality. If you don't have good, clean, clear water, you don't have dippers. Uh, and fortunately, we've got a good population of them here in the valley. But they're not just in mountain streams. You also find them in the desert. Uh, I've seen them in the Grand Canyon. They. Uh, swim and fly in effect underwater. Uh, they walk along the bottom of the stream and find uh, invertebrates uh, and um, insect larvae, even fi small fish and fish eggs. Uh, they, they nest uh, near water. This is a pair checking out a nest site near Aces and gathering nesting materials. They're especially, a, there's a nest. This one's by Slaughterhouse Falls up near Aspen. They're especially equipped for an underwater lifestyle in that they've got very thick feathers. So in effect, they've got their own built-in uh, wetsuit. They uh, have got a very slow metabolism and they've got, um, uh, their blood allows them to retain more oxygen than normal. Um, so they're really uh, well adapted to uh, living half their life underwater. Um, this particular picture, you see the little spotlight there. This is a uh, sort of a small cave up on Lincoln Creek, up above Aspen. And that little spotlight shows where the dipper nest is in a little crevice uh, underneath the uh, rock overhang. And I was able to use the telephoto lens and zoom in on that nest site, which showed a mother and two youngsters right here. 
Actually, there's a third one right there. And there's one of the youngsters a few weeks later. The great horned owl, one of our more charismatic birds. Um, it's one of the largest North American owls. Uh, weighs two and a half pounds or about the size of your average kitchen toaster. Uh, the snowy owl is actually heavier. Uh, the great gray owl is significantly taller but actually weighs less. The great gray owl is mostly feathers. Um, the, the great horned owl uh, is found all over the uh, North American continent. Uh, and this is its mating season. Uh, this picture was taken on the roof of our house a couple of years ago, about three o'clock in the morning. A couple of birds were up there hooting at each other. Um, so that's the kind of behavior that you might see from a great horned owl this time of year. They're very early nesters. They've got a long incubation period and a long growing period for the youngsters. Here's one on a nest. That's the mate of the one on the nest. This was a very windy day. He was having a little trouble keeping his perch. Here's another one on a nest. The male stands guard while the female incubates. Although this guy seemed to be sleeping on duty. <laughs> and there's the female with the, with the chick. The chicks look like stuffed animals. They're really funny looking. <laughs> but in a few weeks, they grow out of that fluff. And this is a young one on, its, on one of its first flights. The uh, mother bird took the young ones over uh, across the river to perch in a cottonwood, flew them back and forth a few times. The lazuli bunting, uh, one of our more colorful, really gorgeous songbirds. Uh, it's a smallish bird, a little, little bigger than a sparrow. Um, it uh, arrives in the spring and the males will sing all summer long. One of the interesting things about this bird is that the males arrive on the nesting grounds without a song. They listen to the other males and imitate them and modify the songs so that each bird has its own audio barcode. Each bird has a very individual song, even though they all sound like lazuli buntings. The lazuli comes from that blue color named after the lapis lazuli mineral. One of the best places to look for these birds is the Lake Christine area. Uh, the area where they nest and, and hang out wasn't affected by the fire. So uh, in uh, May, June, July, you can uh, pretty dependably see these in that neighborhood. This is a young one. Uh, you can see it hasn't quite come into its full color yet. The great blue heron, another great bird. Um, also very widely distributed. You can find them anywhere from uh, the coast of Alaska to Florida. Um, this bird has got some adaptations to keep its feathers clean. It has powder down feathers, which it crushes up and rubs the down or the, the powder through its feathers to clean off water and algae and slime because it spends so much of its time uh, wading in mucky water. It also has what's called a pectinite uh, toe. Uh, you can see it's kind of like a comb. This is actually on a nighthawk. Several birds have this adaptation, but it's like having a built-in comb on your foot and it uses that um, formation to 
comb its feathers and uh, keep itself clean. There are some uh, great blue herons that hang around all year. Most of them migrate and come back in the spring to reoccupy their heronry uh, or rookery. This one is near Rock Bottom Ranch. They nest colonially and eventually the uh, bird poop and the uh, damage that they do to the trees will kill the tree and they'll have to move on to a new one. Here's one in Florida finding a fish. This one is from Oregon, also from Oregon. This is a young one. You can see that it also hasn't fully come into its color yet. This is the same bird. This is at North Star. The hooded merganser, um, another migratory duck that comes through here in the winter, um, a real perky little duck. Um, this pair was at the Crawford Ponds in Elgebel last winter. Uh, they spent the, the Christmas holidays in uh, Colorado. Here they are diving synchronously. These birds will um, press the air out of their feathers before they dive. If you look closely, you can actually see them get noticeably smaller, and that's how you know they're about to go underwater. Here's one just coming up. Mergansers, as you, can, as you can kind of see in this picture, have actually serrated beaks to make it easier for them to um, grasp their prey. This one's got a crayfish. They're also one of the few mergansers that eat anything other than fish. Uh, they'll eat, uh, as you can see, crayfish, worms, all kinds of things. And most mergansers are strictly fish eaters. We were able to see a couple of these a few days ago uh, doing one of their mating displays. They'll, uh, the males will uh, show off their headdresses, their white headdresses, uh, raise them up, shake them back and forth, shake their uh, heads up and down. It's pretty funny to watch. And finally, the goldfinch. So the goldfinch is a familiar garden bird, familiar feeder bird, um, really a lovely little bird, uh, very acrobatic. Um, they are almost exclusively seed eaters, uh, unlike most finches or birds for that matter, who will look for insects and other protein sources, particularly when they're nesting. These guys uh, almost eat 100% seeds. And one of the interesting things about that is that because their diet is so low in protein, um, they, are very, they have very little predation from cowbirds because cowbirds need protein and they don't have the adaptations to convert seed carbohydrates into protein the way uh, the goldfinches can. So cowbirds are very seldom successful in, in goldfinch nests. Uh, this is the female. You can see it's very drab compared to the male. The male's yellow coloring comes from its diet. So the females prefer the males with the brightest gold coloring as evidence of their effectiveness as foragers. In the winter, the males lose their uh, molt into this more drab coloring. This is a, a mixed flock at the uh, thistle sock. Male and female. And for the sake of comparison, a lesser goldfinch. Uh, a smaller bird with a little bit different coloration, but also found in this area. And that's the end. We'd be, we'd be happy to take questions, if anybody has any. We've answered every question.
wonderful show, you two. Thank you. questions I have. Uh, first of all, this doesn't relate to what you showed, but why are we seeing so many robins in the uh, Sopras Capitol Creek Valley now? Well, that probably has to do, is this on? That probably has to do with uh, the abundance of fruit. Uh, we have a good fruit crop this year, and Robin switched to eating fruits in the winter. And um, you know, we, we do see fluctuations in their numbers from winter to winter, particularly when we're out on the Christmas bird count. That's a good comparison. Um, so uh, I, I'll explain that by, uh, by way of food resources. hummingbirds, uh, they're so athletic and so amazing how they can maneuver, yet they both, as well as other birds, so many other birds, unlike owls, have their eyes on opposite sides of their head. How do they see? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, eye placement on birds is, is uh, very precisely honed by millennia of evolution. Um, they need whatever particular type of site to look out for predators and to find their food. Um, so birds like owls have their eyes facing forward. We can relate, because ours do too. Um, and they have a lot of binocular vision right in front of them so that they can see their prey very precisely. They also use a lot of um, auditory cues with their acute hearing in combination with that great binocular vision. Other birds like the goldfinches, the hummingbirds, that have um, their eyes placed more on the sides of the head, they need to be able to see a greater amount of peripheral area to the sides to watch out for predators and to see whatever it is that they're foraging on as well. Um, another example in the opposite extreme is the American <coughs> woodcock. Uh, we didn't show that bird because it's not a local one here, but this bird uh, forages on the ground, probing with a long bill into the soft soil for worms and food, other food that it eats. And um, this bird has eyes not, not just on the sides, but like even more toward the back of the head, and they actually have binocular vision behind them so that while they're poking in the mud, they can watch for any threats from above. So that's kind of the explanation for, for that. <laughs> Be loud, right? So I was up in Snowmass today and um, on a sun deck, and there were Canada jays up there, and I never see them in Carbondale. I have shrub jays and stellar jays here. Do those Canada jays live at a higher altitude? What's their range? Yeah, typically, typically Canada jays are above eight thousand feet, um, and. This time of year, you can see almost anything anywhere. Uh, the, the weather has a tremendous amount to do with where birds will go. And in a relatively <coughs> severe winter like this one, uh, it wouldn't be uncommon for gray jays to be found at much lower altitudes. Um, probably the best example of this, though, is the rosy finches, which nest on the tundra uh, and are virtually never seen below timberline during the warm weather months. And this time of year, you can see them any number of places, like the Snowmass ski area. Uh, uh, and, and that's partly because they're fed there, and partly because the tundra is so harsh this time of year, they need to go below timberline to find shelter. All right, good time. Mark has, Mark and Rebecca have their books here. And they're happy to answer and have any more discussion with any of your questions or just conversation. So thanks again to them and thanks again to all of you for coming. <laughs>